So here we are, Marion. It's uh, Saturday morning in April 1991. You're almost 77 years old, and that's pretty hard to believe. Uh, and looking back on really a lifetime of work, and I really wanted this chance to talk with you to have some of your reflections on what you've done as your life work. You've been working for decades as a physical therapist and now for 20, 20, has it been 20 years since you first trained? Just 20. Yes. Trained Sarah Webb as your first student. Yes. And in this past decade, a whole institute has flourished and your work is known here and also internationally. You've got, I don't know, over a hundred practitioners and many, many students. And so I want to talk with you, but also in a way you're talking to all of us, all of us who have been your students. And one of the questions that I have for you is in a very essential way, what is this work that, that you have done and that you're still doing? What is this Rosen Method body work? Every time I'm asking that question, being asked that question, I answer it in a different way. <coughs> so I will probably answer it in a, in a different way now. It is a way, intellectually, of contacting somebody's unconscious by contacting their musculature. So through their body, we have found a way into their unconscious. And maybe, maybe that, in a nutshell, is something, something different. I do not know so much about other disciplines and what other disciplines do. But I know that this way that people relax when we work with them gives the body a chance of opening up in a very deep level. And this opening up on that level seems to reach into our unconscious. What's the point of reaching into the unconscious. I'm asking myself that question very often too. Oh. What is the unconscious doing for us and with us? I think it stores memories that we have experiences and of parts of our lives that at the time it happened or they happened, we could not handle them. And in order to survive, we put them somewhere where we have, did not have access to it, where we did not have the necessity to handle them. And they are really being kept there, the way we experience them. Now, we would think maybe we better leave them there. If we couldn't handle them at some time, can we handle them now? <coughs> I found out that the body will allow things to come up only to the degree as we can handle them at that time. It doesn't allow, it doesn't spill the experiences all over the place. It allows us some small windows to look or to feel about what happened and 
So it gives us a chance to re-experience what we have put away at that point. You mean if we're not ready, uh, our bodies won't allow something to come into our awareness? That's or? what I think. Uh -huh. That's what I have experienced. Because I have, so far in these 20 years, never experienced people not being able to handle what is coming up. I also have to say, as somebody very nicely said, this is work for well people, well people with barriers in their lives, well yeah. people who do not function to their full potential. They have not used all the possibilities that they would have as that particular person. And the key to that not working on their full potential lies in what we or they have put away in their unconscious. So our barriers to our fulfillment are be, to be found in the unconscious. And by <coughs> contacting these barriers, by allowing them to show up, we know what we have to deal with, what we're facing. What do you mean contacting these barriers? Contacting me and then bringing them into consciousness, oh. bringing them into awareness. Uh -huh. Because when they are unconscious, they are not a, we are not aware that anything exists. We know that we are not very successful in relationships. We know we do not have the work that fully satisfies us. Or if we have work we like, that we cannot use ourselves to our best possibility. And whatever holds us back, according to my experience, is to be found in the unconscious. And by becoming aware what it is that holds us back, we can do something about it. We have the choice, the choice and the possibility to change that, that condition. And I found this to be an inc extremely effective way, not only to contact the unconscious, but to be able to change your life to be able not only to change your life, but to allow something to happen to you, which I call a transformation. I think people become different when we work with them. Not any different from who they are, but they become the person they really are which they often have forgotten. And then, when they become the person they really are, that is so different from the person that they thought they were before, as the person they are, they can really function as their fullest. And to see that trans transition now, from the one person to the other, to the person to the person they are meant to be. That is the exciting thing about our work. <coughs> what is it unique about Rosen method? You know, there are all sorts of therapies and ways of working with oneself. <coughs> the, 
that are available. Uh, what is it particularly about Rosen Method that accesses this, that helps a person contact their barriers and move into being who they really are? I don't. I have to have something to drink. Okay, let me get you some water. <coughs> So what is it in our work that is different from other disciplines? Yes. Our approach is different. Namely, that we do not want to do anything to people. We want to give them a possibility to let something happen to them. And only in this letting something happen do we go deeply into their unconscious. When we do something, the principle of doing is always a contraction like it is in the muscle. When we do something with the muscle, it shortens, it contracts, it closes. <clears throat> when we want to open something, we cannot tear it apart. We can, of course, tear a certain opening into material. But in order to reach deeply, the opening has to come from the inside out, it has to be a letting, a letting the opening happen in order to come down to, to the depths of wherever the, wherever the unconscious material is buried. And the deeper a person trusts you, the deeper they can give themselves over to you, the deeper they can give themselves over to themselves, the more possible, the greater is the possibility of coming in contact with these long lost experiences. I feel when you involve the mind and the mind is trying to find something, there is effort involved, even in the easiest way of doing that. You think of something, you look for something, it is all active thing. And these, this activity is part of the closure on the material wanting to rise up. So we do not want that to happen. So our work is non-obtrusive. Our questions are put to the body, to the feeling, really on a, on a level that keeps out the effort in the mind. So people answer without having to think a lot about it. They let the answers come out of themselves. Well, how, how do you do that? How do you put things to people to not contact and engage the mind? We have a few uh, leading questions that we say, you know, what happened? And I think this is one of the best, the best way to not ask them the, how do you feel about it, what do you think about it, but just ask what happened. And often that gives the opening to whatever there was that they put away. The less we 
lead people to something, the more the chance, the higher the chance gets. A moment. That they dare to open up, that they dare to let slip out what it is that has been hurting them at one time or the other. And they had to put away. Well, when you're doing a session, when you're with someone and you're not engaged in doing, that's a wrong word as I used it right then, when you're doing a session, when you're being with someone in a session, what is your attention on or what is it that, that, that you focus on in this being with? First I focus on the parts in the body that are held in tension which means <clears throat> that they have muscles that work all the time and never relax. In a normal body, muscles contract and relax, contract and relax. When we are under tension, what we call tension, the body contracts in a certain way and never relaxes. So it's a constant working that it is, and that constant working feels hard, uh, like I the hard muscle with a bunched up muscle. It has a different consistency from a muscle that is working and not working, that is going through the phases of normal muscular workings. Of Contracting and relaxing and That's contracting right. and relaxing. That's right. Which feels different to our hand than the muscle that is working all the time. That is one of the things that I look for, look at. And the other one is to see where the breath goes in the body. That gives us a lot of insight where the holdings are, how deep the holdings are. When you are tight at one area, you not only immobilize the muscle there, but you also immobilize part of the body there. So when there is a breath going through the body, that area probably is not being moved. It's still. It's not included in the movement of the rest of the body. And that shows us there is some part that our, our client or person we are working with had the necessity to not, to not open up, had the necessity to keep out of its normal life, life experience. Let me see if I, if I understand this, that when an area is held and the, as the breath moves through the body, it won't move through that area? That's right. That area does not move. Uh -huh. We can see it or feel it, that this area is not being moved. So that's an indication to you yeah. that this is an area where there are barriers that's right. that are holding back yeah. unconscious experience. Where my interest would go to. Yes. Uh -huh. Is, am I answering? Yes, that so the tight muscles and, and the breath. And the breath are yeah. the two things that you focus on. That's right. Anything else? Yes, then I focus on the whole person. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in on the whole, the how the body is laid out is that every part of the body is is in accordance with the rest of it. For instance, people do not have huge arms and small legs. Usually when they have long arms, they also have long legs. When they are, have broad shoulders, you know, then usually the rest of them is laid out accordingly. 
but often we see people where that doesn't hold true. And I think when it doesn't hold true, it is not the children were born that way, but in their growing up, they shaped their body in that way. And I feel that this, this shaping of the body that is not according to the norm is something that is very important for them. Can you turn it off a moment? I, I need to, apparently some. Okay, so you were just talking about looking at the, the whole body, and in a sense, whether it's balanced, would this be a way of talking about it? Whether there's yeah. something that, that is unusually developed or is unusually underdeveloped, for instance. Sometimes people have very wide hips and a very small shoulder, yes. girdle, or chest. Or they have a very wide chest and very small hips. Or they have very big legs and a very tiny, fragile body. And these, uh, these things give me an, an inkling about what part of their bodies did they have to use an awful lot. Which part of their bodies did they not use at all? Did they sort of abandon in their, in their way of living? So then are you lo you're looking at both sides of it, the overdeveloped and the underdeveloped. That's right. And the overdeveloped would be the area that's been used more, for example? Yes, uh -huh. and the other one would be the part that was abandoned. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that is one thing I'm looking at. Then I'm looking at the uh, expression in the person's face while I'm working on it, the color of the face and also the age that the face looks while I'm working on. And that is to me something that I don't understand, but it's happening again and again, that a person's face will take on almost the age of the time something happened in their lives that was an, ex an experience that they had put away in their unconscious. So that you can, when you look at a person, almost see how old they were when something happened to them. And I find, if I get that right, if I get the age right that they look, they seem to remember, they seem to get in touch with these experiences they had put away. Now, is this something you see when they have relaxed and opened, you see a different age appear? When they have very much relaxed and opened, uh -huh. that seems to happen. So in a treatment, it is often towards the end of a treatment. It takes quite a, a time to work on a person before they are able to, to let go, before they are coming into a state of having, <coughs> having experiences come up or even being in a state of not holding down whatever might like to come up. And often it is not the experience coming to their to their mind even. Often it is just shown in their body, in their expression. Mm -hmm. Or it is shown in their emotional not in their emotional, in the way they show their feelings. For instance, they cry or they they get sad. Sometimes they are just moved, not sad, but moved when something happens to them 
that really touches them. When they find out, for instance, that the parents that they've hated all their lives, that they really love them, that there is a deep love in them that they have put away there for reasons of whatever. They found more and more that the reasons why things happened are not as important as what really is happening. How the person is really feeling about somebody or something in their lives. I don't understand that. The, the reasons, I understand the reasons that why things happened aren't as important, yeah. but I don't understand the other but side. But their reaction ah, towards yes. their response their to response what happens. Their response to what happens is, thank you, their response is so important. And their true response, not the response is, I'm angry because, mm -hmm. but I'm hurting. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't love me. I'm hurting. Or they died, and I miss them so much, and I'm hurting. I'm longing for them. And why do I hurt? Why do I long? Mm. It is because I love them. Mm. And that is the, usually the end inside that comes when you go very deeply. We're getting in touch with the feelings of, of love. Mm -hmm. Many people have frightening experiences that they've put away. And that is I'm, I'm trying to find the right connection with it. When they get in touch with having had a frightening experience, that opens something up for them too, letting them know that that something in their lives has been really uh, very hard for them to handle. By now, I don't even think that this insight and knowledge is the most important thing. To me, the most important thing is once they know that, what is, once they know that, what can they do with it in their real life? How can they free themselves from whatever is happening in their lives? For instance, if there was an act of violence they, they witnessed or that was done to them, there is something terrible that has happened to them. But it is also terrible when they expect this act of violence to happen again. They sort of suspect everybody in their lives to act the same way towards them, to hurt them again. And the important thing is when the insight comes, that person that is with me now is not the person that hurt me before that violence that happened at that time is not what is going to happen right now. This is a different way. It held me back from experiencing that person, the other person. But that person I'm with now is a different person than the ones I experienced when I had that experience of violence. In your, in your experience, what is it that makes it possible for someone to see that clearly or to know that in their being, to make that choice, the choice away from that conditioned habitual 
reaction that everyone is potentially <coughs> going to hurt them, for example. I think sometimes that is where skilled questions can come in from us. When we say, uh, the person you're with now is a different person than the one you experienced. How does it feel to you? Yeah. Just to look, to, to bring their attention to the possibility that the here now is different from the experience back there when. It sounds like these questions, in a sense, at this point, which is a big point of openness yeah. and shift, that these questions that you might ask, in a sense, engage the mind. Is that correct? They engage the mind as little as possible to engage the mind into the looking. Into the looking, yes. Which is also an, an active act, but it is a looking with your inside, yes, with yes. your feelings more than with your critical and anal analytical thinking. Yes. So the question that is being put is towards the feeling, not towards the understanding. And is to engage them looking now with this new openness. That's right to see more clearly that this person today yes. is not that person from back then. That was there. Yes. But that they do not have to take that, shut out that feeling that they had before, that that feeling is available, is available as an experience and can be with them as that experience, but is not what happens now. I think that is that is what what I hear myself say quite often. <coughs> this is not what happens now. And what's happening now? Well, this shift seems <coughs> like a momentous one. It is momentous. That and is momentous. Do you, and do you find that many people are able to make it with you? Yes, mm. that's what I find. And that makes this work so fulfilling. Mm. Yeah. That is one of my questions for you, is like, what keeps you going? I mean, you, you, you've definitely contributed a lot. And you have a whole legacy that is now ongoing of this work. And yet, you are still very, very active. You're traveling all over. You, you do a schedule that most of us can't keep up with. You still have a, an active private practice and a very active teaching practice. What is it that keeps you going? That incredible joy to see people really come to life after they've put life away for themselves leaving pain behind, leaving, uh, leaving behind a life of existing rather than living, and taking on life in a different way. When people come back, after a few treatments and say, my life is different, it's just not the same. And they look, they look so different that it's hard to think they're the same person that you met a few weeks before. Sometimes a few weeks, sometimes a few months. And when you see them again after a few years, <coughs> and 
their life has taken a swing up. Sometimes not even their lives, but they themselves. As somebody said, my life is still a mess, <laughs> but the way I am with my life is so different. The life is a mess, but I'm having a good time. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm with it. And I, I'm satisfied. I can, I do, I can do my best now. <laughs> with whatever the given, the given circumstances are. Reminds me of when I was a student and I was having a treatment in the classroom by somebody else, and you were across the room, and I was going on and on about the circumstances of my life and wondering what to do about them in my work at the medical center. And somehow you picked up on it and you called from across the room. My question was, I don't know what's the point of me being there. I don't know what my job is there. And you called out to me, your job is to make the room light up when you walk in. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I really like that. <laughs> So thinking back over these years from when I first knew you, I find myself wondering if you can reflect on what you know now that you didn't know, let's say, ten years ago when all these trainings really got started. You know, what has sort of risen um, more into your focus? First I want to say that I'm now convinced that the work we are doing is really good. That it is of, of great use to people. And I can really stand behind that now. <coughs> I did not dare say that maybe ten years ago. Today I'm can very well say this is this is important for many people. Not for everyone, but many people. Uh, many people change their lives by having this work, but getting in touch with that work and receiving work like that. So your experience in these last ten years of seeing so many people, so many students and clients, and seeing the openings that happen, you now can really stand, stand up for this. Yes, I can really stand up for that and can say, yes, that is, that is work that contributes to people. There are still a lot of holes about things that I I would like to know more about, as a matter of fact, many things that are more speculation than really knowledge, but I think... Like what? Well, how it happens that people, when they get in touch with their emotional pain, that they, le that they lose their physical pain. Mm. Don't quite understand that. Except, of course, when you are aware of something, you don't have to put it away. When you don't have to put it away, you don't have to be tense. Now this is the phone again. Okay, let me run and get yeah, it. Yeah, please. Basically, I don't even know yet what makes people relax when we touch them. But it happens, and it happens consistently so. And. The longer we work with them, the more they relax. So there are many, many things that we are constantly learning. Not just I, but all the people who are doing this work. Is there any other question that you have that's, that's an important one for you, that's unanswered? Or maybe another way. Go ahead, do you yes. have something there? The question is, <clears throat> in how far 
to we as a non therapist I suggest something to the person afterwards. Is that our <coughs> up to us? I have to cough again. <coughs> I find myself quite often. I have to stop again. You know. It's okay. <coughs> These are for me a very imp important, very emotional questions, and I find that I cough very often when I get emotional. Ah, this is why this comes up so much now. I find myself, you know, talking about possibilities in one's life in a general way, never in a very directed, specific way. But I talk about the philosophy of accepting some somebody else. For instance, I know that many people who come to us say, my parents never saw me, they never accepted. And sometimes I asked just the question like, are you accepting them? Are you seeing them? So the question is, is this, this seems to be part of the work I'm doing now, to pose questions. And something that you're not as clear about I'm or sure about. I'm not as about clear about and sure about is about this opening up mm -hmm. and what happens then and the transformation that takes place. That I'm sure about. Yes, I hear that. Yeah. Is there anything that you're, that feels unfinished for you? You have all this that you've done, you have these questions that, that interest you now, but is there any particular big piece of your life work that, that feels unfinished? What is unfinished to me is that I feel that it could be much broader use of the work we are doing than it is being used for now. I still think that we could make a big contribution to the medical profession if they would use us in, you know, together with their expertise. And this is what I've been looking for and working for in the last few years. And I'm always very grateful when I'm allowed to, to talk in front of medical people. But the only times that happened was first in Finland where there was a conference of people who were looking for the holistic approach to the patient and who were really interested in the work we were doing. And then, of course, the second group of doctors that were very interested <coughs> was in the Soviet Union. Mary Kay, Mary Wright is now conducting a training for the doctors at one of the medical facilities. So this is a big, a big point, a big chunk in my life that I would like to, to see, proceed. To connect more connect with medical more. people and yes. have your work Used, used in that way. In that way. Uh, overall, I would like to have it more, more available and known to people. And of course, that will take a lot of time in the United States, with all the different towns, and the, all the different places. But if it, if the work is as good as I perceive it to be 
that is a matter only of, <coughs> of time, that it will be so. And if it isn't so, it wasn't as good as I thought it is. But you don't believe that? I don't believe that. Yes. I really think that it is something that can be used and can be of great importance. It is sort of a missing link in the treatment of people. I know there are many things that are now being used that are very important, like acupuncture and uh, what is it? I think this is right now, but there are, there are other, other ways of treating people too, like they do. Before we stop for today, uh, I want to pose a question to you. You know, pretend that it's 50 years from now. Uh, you and I are, are, are both gone from this earth, but this videotape is there at the Rosen Institute, and there are students, and they're looking at it. So I would like to, you to think about what you would like to say to them, to the students and practitioners who are going to be carrying on then. This is work that is of great benefit, or could be of great benefit to many people. Keep that always in mind when you're engaged in this practice, that this is the most important thing about it. Not that you are successful, or known or make money. That is a work that it gives service. Mm. Yeah. And when you do that, your rewards will be tremendous. Mm.